Okay, everyone. So on our uh, presentation today, a Rosicrucian tour of the Roycroft, we'll start first with a, uh, a meditation as has been our, our practice. So I'd like you to uh, take in the image before you. It's one of the beautiful scenes at the Roycroft uh, campus that I'll be talking to you about. And it's actually taken uh, around, this, around this time actually of the year, the winter solstice and take in the beautiful carving and the beautiful woodwork in the ceilings. And think of this in terms of helping attune us with the cosmic. And when you're ready, you may wish to close your eyes and we'll get, start to get prepared to do our meditation. We have a special meditation for you today. It's entitled, The Heart at the Center of the Universe. So with your eyes closed, just take a moment to let go of the cares of the day. Take some few deep breaths. Enjoy the rhythm of the breathing. It's part of the rhythm of the cosmos and the cosmic. And Rosicrucians use the term cosmic to refer to all the nat natural and spiritual laws and the divine intelligence back of the cosmos. You take some more deep breaths. You may wish to concentrate on breathing through the nostrils because that then forces us to take deep breaths, but in a good way. You can feel the cosmic essence or the vital life force possibly tingling in your toes and your fingers. It's an enriching, ennobling feeling. Increasingly, we experience ourselves as a being of light as the traditional Rosicrucian master, Jacob Bohm, used to say. Now the past chief executive officer of our order, Imperator Ralph M. Lewis in his book, Cosmic Mission Fulfilled, talking about the Imperator before him, Dr. H. Spencer Lewis related that Imperator Harvey Spencer Lewis said the following on a way to attune with the cosmic. Prepare us to hear these words. Let us do a rite of purification. May the divine essence of the cosmic infuse my being and cleanse me of all impurities of mind and body, that I may attune with the cosmic in pureness and worthiness, so mote it be. Here's Dr. Lewis speaking to us. In my own case, and in the case of many others who have made the contact often and desired, we have found that by turning the thinking mind or the outer mind inward toward the heart. So just take a moment to with your eyes closed, focus on your heart as though it were the center of the universe. And as though the spiritual kingdom of God consciousness were surrounding the heart in the center of the body, the best results were obtained. Let's just go over the former imperators' directions in case it's helpful. In my own case, and in the case of many others who have made contact often and as desired, it's contact with the cosmic, we have found that by turning the thinking mind or the outer mind inward toward the heart, as though it were the center of the universe, and as though the spiritual kingdom and God consciousness were surrounding the heart, in the center of the body, the best results were obtained. So let us dwell there, focusing on our heart in this fashion.
a past imperator, Harvard Spencer Lewis goes on to say, in thinking this way while sitting in concentration, the first thing that happens is the loss of all consciousness of the outer body and the world around us. I have noticed that whether I was in my room at home, in the temple, or on a steamer, or out in the open country, I quickly forgot where I was and even who I was by turning my thoughts inward in this manner. Minutes pass very rapidly when we sit in such concentration. And all that we are conscious of is the fact that we are within ourselves and in touch with a great cosmic power of some kind. During such concentration, the mind seems to contact all places of the universe and countless personalities. Let us continue to dwell on the heart as we've been instructed. past imperator goes on to say such contacts with the consciousness within are very successful when one is trying to get information from the cosmic an inspiration or an answer to a question in my own experiences and those of others who have talked the matter over with me and in my own experiences Answers come to questions quickly and easily. And it always seems as though suddenly a voice in the center of one's body begins to speak or tell something in a strange way. Let us continue in this meditation as directed.
Now we'll prepare to formally close this meditation. And I wish to say together, and use the term moat, refer to truth. May the God of my heart sanctify this attunement of self with the cosmic, so mote it be. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes rejuvenated, refreshed in this period of meditation with the heart at the center of our being and the universe. So Rosicrucian Tour of the Roycroft. This is from earlier, from, uh, including earlier contributions from the late uh, Kitty Turgeon. The Roy Croft was an arts and crafts community that's in uh, East Aurora, New York, about a half hour drive southeast of Niagara Falls, New York. It's part of a much larger movement of arts and crafts movements that were in the United States, uh, Europe, uh, Canada and beyond. Two particular persons that were involved and at the center of the Roy Croft movement were Alice and Albert Hubbard. Here, see beautiful pictures of them uh, in a Conte crane on paper. You know, part of their inspiration came from those bef before them. For example, when William Morris in the Kelmscott Press in England, it was active during the 19th century. And there was also the great art critic, John Ruskin. Uh, they were inspiring people to take a different view of life and nature. The Industrial Revolution was building up, but there was still an idea that there were some elements of that industrialization that was felt to be dehumanizing. And there was an emphasis on value of working with one's hands and working back with the crafts traditions uh, dating back to the medieval period and earlier. There was also that time um, in the 19th century, I'm thinking particularly of uh, persons that were reviving medieval uh, arts and architecture. People like the uh, uh, ecclesiologists in England or the architect Welby Augustin Pugin, reviving of the Gothic style and the Romanesque style. You'll find in the 19th century, I think in many of your uh, cities and towns, you'll find that there's buildings that are de designed in a medieval revival style that date back to this time. That was in a way associated not directly with the arts and crafts movement, were part of that revival in the 19th century to be spiritualized um, traditions from the past and have a sense of ba balanced life with the work uh, wor and worship. Now it's striking that uh, <clears throat> Albert and uh, Alice actually co-authored a book that was published in 1891. They weren't married at that time um, Albert, Albert was married to uh, Berth, Bertha. She was an important worker with the Roy Croft as well. And it was entitled The Man. It's a rare book. Um, I was able to see it by getting it on loan from microfiche from the Library of Congress in the United States. And it's an esoteric uh, tale. And I, you know, in the Rosicrucian tradition, <clears throat> we often use the phrase, over the temple at Delphi was, was the inscription, know thyself. In the book is added, over the temple of our hearts, let us write the words in white and gold, trust thyself, which is a beautiful compliment um, to, to the uh, former ancient saying. There was a pen name that was used there, as you can see, Aspia Hobbes. Aspasia was also known as a renowned figure from ancient, ancient Athens. Um, in a way, this, this text presages the intentions of the Roycroft that I'm going to be telling you about in a way that it was what they were visualizing and concentrating on, on creating. There was a strong emphasis on the equal rights of men and women uh, and that they would work together uh, to develop themselves in all fashions, including in spiritual matters. Now, Albert Hubbard uh, was a, um, an executive at the Larkin Soap Company in Buffalo, New York. And he had certain deep spiritual experiences that led him to seek out William Morris uh, in England. 
and he was very inspired by what Morris was doing with the arts and crafts movement there and making beautiful books that I'll talk a little bit more about. And he came back to the United States with the idea that he would conclude his work as an executive at the Larkin Soap Company and that he would get very intensely involved with the arts and crafts movement and various other persons joined him, uh, including uh, Alice. Here's an overview of the campus um, of the, in the village of uh, East Aurora, which is a beautiful symbolic name in itself. And the campus term campus is, uh, is uh, uh, used often with colleges and universities, but it's used in other ways as well. Here it's used for an arts and crafts uh, community. You know, the etymology of the word campus is very interesting because a part of it relates back to what's called the, the Latin castrum or the Roman, the Roman camp uh, that an augur would inwardly uh, um, envision the heavenly temple in the sky descending in to make sacred a habitable before the, the camp could be laid out and surveyed. It's part of the deeper meaning of the sense of a campus. But here's a unified group of buildings. There's uh, listed here in the historic both the historic and more closer today, it was circa uh, 2000 from 20 years ago, but many things are the same still. You can find <clears throat> here is where the, uh, the, chap <clears throat> the chapel is. Uh, the uh, chapel was not a religious structure. Chapel was also used in another sense of the meaning of the English word to mean a guild hall of printers. Um, there's also here Whereas the, the Roycroft Inn where people could come and stay. This is actually orientated. So the north side is the north side is here. There's various uh, print shops and furniture shops and bindery shop and copper shop um, and special, special guest house. They were all part of the arts and crafts community. Much of that has been able to stay the way it was. Thanks, thank, part thanks to becoming a national historic site in the United States and having that special uh, designation and protection. Now that you've got sort of a sense of the layout of the campus, let's go down from Main Street, down South Grove Street to here at the Roy Croft Inn, and let's go in one of the great portals there, which is here. You know, Albert Hubbard used to say about East Aurora that it's not a place, but a state of mind. And Part of the Roycroft tradi Roy Croft tradition and the arts of craft tradition was to be very practical, but also have lofty ideals, which, is, which were often referred to as utopia. Utopia means no place, but ideals providing direction for humanity. You know, through the uh, Rosicrucian order, for example, uh, in the Positio document, uh, that was one of the manifestos uh, uh, issued um, re recently by the order in this, in this century, there's the Rosicrucian utopia. In a similar spirit, there was various utopias that are associated with traditional Rosicrucian and others, like the Rosicrucian Johann Valentinus Andrea, who wrote Christianopolis in 1619, or um, the uh, traditional past imperator, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, in his New Atlantis, or in earlier times, Plato in his Republic, setting up ideals for humanity. And over time, those ideals can become realities and you can have a vision of new ideals. One thing is very beautiful in the great portal. It says, produce great people, the rest follows. Now that description is based uh, closely on a quote attributed to a poem by Walt Whitman. The poem is titled, By Blue Ontario Shore. This is something that's a very inspiring and deep statement. It ties in with the work of the Rosicrucian Order, for example, through uh, um, past imperator Harvey Spencer Lewis when he formed the Child Culture Institute um, that um, expecting parents, when even before the child has been born, can help uh, with working harmonious conditions, inspiring conditions to attract the right soul, first, the appropriate or inspired soul personality to come at the first breath. And then those first seven years that are the work of the Child Culture Institute and others, as was done in ancient Egypt, and I should say ancient Greece and uh, uh, ancient India. So you get a sense even from the store that uh, they're very practical, but they're also very idealistic uh, persons. 
as we come further in, here's a view uh, looking back towards that large door. Here's one of the windows from a visit we took uh, uh, um, around the time uh, between Chris Christmas and New Year's. There's a beautiful blue, I should say beautiful red tulip and the hearths were very important. Um, this is the hearth over here. It was a hearth burning very warmly and brightly that day. Hearths were very important in the arts and crafts tradition as a place of community, a place of connection, a place of alchemical transformation. If we go further straight up and up, up the tower, there's a tower there and up the stairs and look back down the room, we'll see the, the image that we saw when we were meditating. You'll notice the beautiful wood carving, things, the emphasis on working with one's, one's hands to do something beautiful, inspiring, unique and unique. If we have a view outside this structure from in its earlier days, you know, they, the Roycroft got underway in 1895. You'll see this is where the first print shop was that later became part of the inn. And this part here is called the Fallon Street. It's very interesting that the tower here, which you see inside of, had four levels. It started with the Roycroft presses because printing was very important. And then there was Albert Hubbard's library. And above that was the William Morris room. And ultimately you get up to the John Ruskin room. So you see they were uh, recognizing these great figures from 19th century England in the arts and crafts tradition um, in the, uh, the, the, the tower here. Let us move around a little bit more on campus. And you'll see, remember I mentioned about the, uh, the chapel and the print shop. Here's a view, view of, the, of the, the chapel I spoke of earlier, which was the guild hall of the, of the printers. You see the medieval revival style here with the Gothic windows and the crenellations that you associate often with a medieval, a medieval castle built very, very uh, strong to last. Here's a beautiful Roycroft card. You see the stylized art. Uh, um. Also, if you go inside the chapel here, again, not a religious structure, but a guild hall of printers, you'll see again the, the wonderful woodwork in the ceiling, the beautiful and the beautiful hearth. We've had a, some, a Rosicrucian Amark uh, public event was held in this room, for example. Now, when they uh, got underway with the printing associated with the Roycroft Chapel, the, uh, one of the first things that they printed, in fact, the very first was a mystical allegory, a song of songs associated with uh, King Solomon. And that's one of the mystical allegories of the Western tradition associating the experience of love of another with the mystical experience of the God, of the God within. This is one in many ways you can see the tradition of the Roy Croft were associated with mysticism. Another thing that they did in terms of printing and uh, um, Alice and Elbert were very prolific and they work, they work closely together. A lot of writings you'll see from Elbert, but they would discuss them and she would edit them and she did writings of her own in her own right now, quote her shortly. One of uh, Elbert's prolific uh, undertaking was little journeys to the homes of great teachings. They also did a little journeys to the homes of others who were known for renowned for other things. For example, great, uh, great artists or great writers. Here's one uh, that was for Booker T. Washington, you know, the renowned educator, author, and African-American civil rights leader did it from 1856 to 1915, was an inspiring figure for the Roy Crofters. I mentioned about Alice being a, a prolific writer as well. She's a teacher, writer, administrator, suffragist, mother, and visionary. You can see her dates there from 1861 to 1915. Here's some uh, quotes from her, from her, her book, Woman's Work. The human female has as much gray matter in proportion to her size as the male. Now the doors of the best institutions for learning from books are open to humanity. Not one half, but all. And then also from women's work. You see, the difficulty is that women are part of the human race. They won't stay put. They are bound to develop if they have the opportunity. Now, this is writing over 100 years ago. 
These are very progressive statements. You know, it's very uh, befitting that she'd be writing these things in East Aurora because East Aurora is the Western door of the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee or the six, six nations of the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee. Um, they had a great avatar that came among them called the Peacemaker. And he let, set down various laws of equality and ways of conducting in, in a peaceful way and gathering states together that was part of the inspiration of the for, later forming the United States. But many of the early women feminists and suffragists that were very active in the Finger Lake district of uh, New York State during the um, uh, 19th century. I know many of you think maybe thinking of uh, Mott and uh, um, uh, various, various others. They, they had contact with the clan mothers of the Haudenosaunee and, and they were very surprised as early Europeans coming to this continent were how well respected uh, women were among the Haudenosaunee. And so some of those early suffragists actually became uh, honorary adoptees into some of the nations of the Haudenosaunee. And in their writings, they mentioned about uh, how they observed uh, how well women were being treated. And that was part of the inspiration of the feminist movement. And uh, Alice was part of that. Here's some more things for you to bear in mind with her in her mysticism. Nature is said to love the female more than the male, for she serves her more devotedly and nature has taken care that she shall from the myth in marriage. Also in the myth of marriage, there is a sublime dignity and love, a majesty that suggests unlimited power. To love is an individual experience. The object of the love is the only means to the end of awakening and purification. Similar to what we did in our meditation uh, today. Among the many publications that the Roy Crofters had that Alice and Albert were uh, instrumental in initiating uh, was the Philistine. And here's a, here's a very mystical symbolism of an initiate coming up steps and they're uh, radiating uh, the divine intelligence from them here as they observe nature and its great race here. You know that, uh, uh, so the steps of initiation also appear in the Salon uh, Rose Croix uh, poster uh, that was in Paris, uh, a salon from 1892 to 1897, guided by Rosicrucians such as Joseph Peladon. Well, the Roy Crofters were inspired by that salon and they in fact created their own salon that's in the Roy Crofton. Here's an early picture of it, of the sort of the seat of honor where various speakers came to uh, hold forth. One of the inspiring speakers there was the traditional Rosicrucian that worked on the uh, uh, First Council with Dr. H. Spencer Lewis as Albert Hubbard and uh, uh, Alice Hubbard worked on that council with uh, Dr. Lewis as well. In fact, they were part of the, uh, before the um, 1915, they were part of the uh, Rosicrucian Research Council, which was the inner name for the uh, New York uh, Psycho Research Society. Um, these persons, uh, like uh, Wilcox and the Hubbards were, were part of that working with um, H. Spencer Lewis. You know, it's very interesting that in that uh, uh, salon room, there's some very beautiful murals and there's this plaque up here and it's a very key sign here that the room was evolved. Again, this is another telltale sign of the Rosicrucian connection and thinking along Rosicrucian lines. It was evolved by Alice Hubbard, who's the uh, des designer, James uh, Cadro architect. Alex Fournier was the painter and it's dated to 1905. I wanna show you some of the murals there because you know, associated with the arts and crafts movement and the revival of the Gothic and medieval architecture and uh, Romanesque architecture, medieval architecture was associated with what was called the mural movement was active uh, in the second half of the 19th century, United States, Canada uh, and Europe and beyond. And uh, it was an idea that through murals and public spaces, like such as in train stations uh, and other libraries and public spaces, I think you'll think back in your own city, you think back to your memory, there are some inspiring murals from earlier times. They had them in the salon room there and, then, and they had some of the great wonders of the world, some of the great inspiring temples of the world. For example, we have some, some of the pyramids of uh, ancient Egypt. 
uh, and the Sphinx. Uh, here's a, a, a temple in the Greek tradition. Here's a temple in the um, uh, Asian tradition. There was also times of the day. There was also the seasons. Uh, here's the depiction uh, earlier times around uh, the Roycroft. And there's a beautiful picture of the Roycroft campus uh, that had uh, orchards. Earlier times, there was an apple orchard, but they still had uh, trees that would, uh, fruit trees and bloom there. See a beautiful idyllic scene. In the Roycroft, they would emphasize fresh air, you know, clean water, clean living, exercise. Uh, they had a Roycroft farm where they could get locally produced uh, fresh food. Also a very beautiful thing about the Roycroft, especially for the student of the Rosicrucian order, there's lots of telltale signs of uh, profound writings that were in, inscribed and sized into the wood. For example, here over where it was the chapel, there's a uh, master of the guidance that says, raise the stone and thou shalt find me. Cleave the wood and there I am. Now that statement, you may recognize it. Um, it's associated with a poem by Henry Van Dyke. Um, they who tread the path of labor, but even before him, there's the hymn of Joshua Lerat, Jesus, um, but thou uh, divine companion. But even before that, this statement goes back to the Gnostic gospel of Thomas, saying 77, where it's talking about Yeheshua as the light in all things. Another inspiring statement that they have on another great portal uh, of the Roycroft and you saw one earlier uh, was this one here. The love you liberate in your work is the love you keep. You know, Dr. H. Spencer Lewis mentioned on occasion, he heard Albert speak because like, doc, like Dr. Lewis, Albert Hubbard was a great orator. Um, he was also a genius in advertising. Uh, like our past comparator, Harvey Spencer Lewis. The men had lots of things in mind. In fact, uh, I would think that uh, when Dr. Lewis was writing uh, the book, Rosicrucian Principles for Home and Business, uh, some of the people that he would have in mind were the uh, uh, Albert and Alice Hubbard. Now, at uh, one of uh, Albert's um, public speaking engagements, that uh, Dr. Lewis was at, he mentioned about how uh, Albert said to the effect that uh, we, we in East Aurora have, have given away what we, fresh, what we uh, prize most or is most precious to us. And Dr. Lewis recognized in a way that's a terse expression of what we say here, uh, but also being very giving and loving and the idea of the law of compensation that as, as we give, so we receive to do that in a thorough way. And the idea with the arts and crafts was that making beautiful things that would give a part that you would impart some of your soul in, in a way that uh, um, in this uh, psychokinetic way, in a way that with your labor and, and signs in, in your unique work by your hands and giving that away, you were giving away something in a very, a very loving way. Here's another inspiring inscription. Art is the expression of man's, or you could say the human's joy in his or her work. You know, this is a way the ideal, you know, we've talked about uh, uh, two weeks ago about experiencing the cosmic and emulating the cosmic in a way we're seeing this in a very profound way as we travel through in a virtual and mystical way through the Roycroft and its high ideals. And the way this, this is a key uh, to being highly satisfied and having highly meaningful work and how to take up our work, uh, whether it's paid employment, or how we cook a meal or however, what, whatever we do in our life. You know, continuing uh, back into the uh, Roy Crofton, they had a place there where people could eat, come and eat the fresh food from the, the uh, locally sourced food. You know, it's interesting how things come back. We realize the value of things. There were various plaques up in wood where people were, were to eat. And there was more guidance uh, of the masterly character for self mastery. Fletcherize, um, was a very common expression about to do it had to do with well, to essentially to do with chewing your food well, something we learn in the, in the in, learn in the order. You know, the Roycrofters, when they say, well, I don't hear, 
And we say, well, that's interesting, your presentation. Oh, I think I heard about them or have I heard about them? If it was back when they were active, you would have heard about them. They were a household word in the United States and Canada. You see here, their self-control, self-reliance, very important thing we learned very early in your reciprocity, reciprocity, uh, very important in terms of giving and taking exchanges, moderate, moderate, moderation or the middle path, uh, we know from the Rosicrucian Code of Life, equanimity that we learned from uh, deep attunement with the master within, uh, the mutuality, the mutual respect, and working in mutuality with people. You know, lots of guidance that was being said. They had at the uh, Roycroft what was called uh, the School of Life, which in a way is a beautiful way to think about what our Rosicrucian uh, studies, the, the School of Life uh, for, for teaching of young, young persons. You know, some of you may be intrigued by the, uh, the Roycroft symbol. It's a sign and a, a trying expression. You'll find it here, the expression head, he, hand, heart, and head, a close up on the original Roycroft symbol. And also very tellingly, in one of the murals in the uh, salon in the Roycroft Inn, there's a sail that has HHH, and you'll notice here the orb with the cross, cross on top to part associated with the idea of divine sovereignship, which we're all called to in a mystical way. But, you know, the Roy, the Roycroft symbol and the Roycroft, I know that Albert Hubbard, he created a, a Roycroft dictionary and he tells us that, that Roy means king and Croft means home or craft. Uh, Croft can often mean a section of land, but also in Old English, craft was often sometimes spelled even with an O as well to mean a craft. That's, he, he, he goes on to relate that Roycroft, that means kingcraft or you know, sovereign craft, uh, working for the highest, doing your work just as good as you can, making things for the king. You know, this is the dignity and divinity of labor through peace, reciprocity, health, industry, persistence, and endurance. The uh, Roycroft. I'll tell you in a little while about the Renaissance of the Roycroft and they use the Roycroft Renaissance artisans. They use a similar symbol list, but it's got a double R for the, for the uh, uh, Roycroft Renaissance and a few other beautiful adjustments. I wanna show you a few other inspiring things before we move on to the Roycroft Renaissance and finish up. You know that uh, there's a Magna Matter sculpture that they uh, commissioned to have on the Roycroft campuses by Catherine a malt with it you may know about who's a student of theosophical and Ros Rosicrucian subjects on the theme of the great mother or the magna matter from the Latin, associated with temples and initiation, and divine feminine and Roman and other cultures. And there's also a quote from uh, Ecclesiasticus 40 there, great Tavai is created for every man and a heavy yoke is upon the sons of Adam from the day they go out of their mother's womb till the day they return to the mother of all things. And you see they're coming and going here with the great, great uh, um, mother. Yeah, that's one of the inspiring things that you can see when you go to the Roycroft campus. So um, the Roycroft uh, was going strong for 20 years. And then <clears throat> Alice and Albert Hubbard planned a trip on the Lusitania in 1915. Now, Dr. H. Spencer Lewis uh, relates the, uh, the following. He says that uh, Albert was so busy for the few days while he was in New York City, about to take the Lusitania, that he was unable to attend the council meeting. So he's talking about the, that first Rosicrucian council meeting, the formation of Amorc uh, in his second cycle of activity in the Americas. So he was unable to attend the council meeting and his wife wrote a letter from the New York hotel to me apologizing for their inability to be at the meeting, but wishing that our work would continue to evolve and ensuring me of their very best wishes. Now, Dr. H. Spencer Lewis went on to relate that uh, when Albert was talking to some um, newspaper writers before stepping onto the Lusitania, he said, when told that he was going into the face of death by taking such a trip, he replied calmly, then I am ready for the, that magnificent experience.
So you see that took the uh, newspaper reporters aback. But in the Rosicrucian tradition, we have the term transition, and even more profoundly, the great initiation. So Albert was talking about the great initiation. You know, it's quite, uh, it's quite beautiful to note that uh, Albert uh, was very aware of cosmic consciousness. Uh, he had had that experience himself. We can see that from various, various elements of his, his writings. For example, uh, he emphasized that, uh, for example, in his writing on eternity, we are living in eternity now. For example, in that Master of Life booklet, it says, the adept only converses at best with the adept. Around him is a sacred circle, and within it, only the elect are allowed to enter. The brotherhood of consecrated lives admits all who are worthy, and all who are excluded exclude themselves. So you get a sense of the inner, inner Rosicrucian uh, order there. Dr. Lewis also goes on to say that uh, um, that Albert uh, uh, and, and uh, in regard to Albert and Alice that uh, that Fra Albert was thinking of the work of the order right to the, the very day of his transition. And he had, had, Alice and Albert had extended their best wishes and indicated when they came back, they would continue in their work. However, one could say that, uh, you know, that part of the reason they were going was that uh, Albert wanted to go and speak to the German Kaiser, Wilhelm, to talk about we, uh, peace negotiations and development of peace. You see, the United States, of course, at that time had not entered into World War uh, uh, One. Now, I also can say that Al Albert you know, and uh, Alice, in a way, their great work, their um, alchemical journey, um, their mission in life was complete. It was up to others to take, take on their, their duties at that time. They had worked very hard and they fulfilled their mission in life. And as Albert said, I welcome that magnificent experience. In fact, uh, in later years, Albert Hubbard uh, was awarded a humanitarian award by the Rosicrucian Order. The uh, Roy Croft, in its very active form, continued after the, the transition of Alice and Albert up to 1938. And then there was a renaissance of it in 1960. A key figure in that uh, was the Rosicrucian uh, Kitty Turgeon. She worked with many others like Marcia Kirkmeyer, who's a Rosicrucian who's on uh, with us today on this um, teleconference. But you know, the printer Joe uh, Weaver, uh, or Weber, I should say, is a medical doctor, or CJ Hurley, or Barbara Pierce, or Tom Boykowski, and many others inspired uh, to come to the Roycroft campus to learn and relocate in various parts of the uh, uh, United States and the world, but they would continue the Roycroft. Uh, tradition. Here we see a picture from October 22nd, 1984. It was reported on uh, in the 1985 Rosicrucian Digest. We see here Kitty Turgeon, as I mentioned, but here is the uh, beloved Grand Counselor, Alberta Patterson, and the uh, Grand Treasurer at the time, Lamar Kilgore. I know some of you remember, uh, remember these uh, uh, persons. And we see the Rosicrucian and the Roy Croft uh, uh, symbols here. It was interesting that uh, Lamar Kilgore, and I remember going to this uh, presentation, uh, gave a public meeting in the salon. So in a way it was befitting to, to have the um, uh, inspired speaker back in the salon there to give an address. He presented on uh, uh, color, music and mysticism as a Rosicrucian public meeting. I still have notes from it. It was quite inspiring. Now, in terms of the Roy Croft Renaissance, starting from 1960, I want to mention a few of the uh, Roy Croft master artisans, such as C.J. Hurley, as part of 
C.J. Hurley Century Arts with his partner, Barbara Pierce. Here's a beautiful room that they've designed uh, it serves as a, it can serve as a display that's called the White Rose Room. It's a dining room. Can you imagine getting up and having breakfast there? You know, the, I, there was the idea of the Gestam Kunstwerk from the German or the total work of art that you would be, uh, it would address all levels of your being, inspire all the, all the senses and bring you a state of wholeness. Here's another beautiful work by this uh, Roy Croft Renaissance master artisan uh, on the theme of Sir Gwain. It's a gesso panel. I know you'll think of immediately there, Sir Gwain and the Green Knight as one of the medieval Arthurian stories on the, to do with the quest uh, for spiritual enlightenment and the grail. You know, it's various mystical symbols there, including the pentagram or the five pointed, pointed star. And part of the ideal of the, the, the Roy Croft that uh, you'd work in a balanced way with your head, your heart and your hands. You know, that's no, the, none, none was better than the other in those. You see, there's the law of balance, which is so important to uh, self mastery. It must have that balanced state, mastery through the hands, the heads and the heart. Another inspiring artist of the Roycroft uh, Renaissance tradition is the master artist in Tom Boychansky. And I quote him here, they saw beauty in all things from art to philosophy, speaking of the, uh, the Roy Crofters and philosophy is traditional sense of love of wisdom. This is an inspiring work that he did, Follow the Light, uh, that shows a view of the Roy Croft Inn. You can actually go and see this work uh, in framed in the, uh, the, Roy, the Roy Croft uh, Inn. Now to sum up our presentation, we can have uh, some time for some discussion. And, and in a moment, uh, Sora Karen's gonna post some uh, AMORC and other resources for you in the group chat if you want to uh, uh, save, save them. I'll say in finishing up here that uh, uh, past imperator H. Spencer Lewis said that uh, in a literary and philosophical sense, Fra as, uh, as uh, Albert was often known as Fra for Frater. Fra Hubbard was a unique character and as the years passed by the uniqueness of his viewpoint, and we could add that of Alice's as well. And the manner of expression, his ex manner of expression will become more and more evident to the younger generation and those who have never read much, I could say of his or her writings. I recommend that some of his or her books, including his scrapbook and other pamphlets be secured at the public library and read for real mental and spiritual profit. So in this presentation, we have continued on the theme of experiencing and emulating the cosmic, whether it be Durham Cathedral, the Detroit Institute of Art, the Roy Croft, I should say the, the Rosicrucian Park, in San Jose, California and the, or the Order of the Amwork, or the Roy Croft and the Roy Croft campus, or your life in environment. In other words, as the painting by the master artisan here, Tom Bochansky, charges us, follow the light. Thank you. <laughs>